Morning. Uh, my name is Bjorn Westgard. I am a uh, faculty at Regions Emergency Medicine Residency Health Partners in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, I am up here today to uh, pro provide a forum uh, for some discussion about uh, sort of an, uh, a, an issue and a particular story, I should say. Um, that uh, you may have uh, heard something about and uh, deserves a little bit of uh, uh, conversation in, uh, I think, open forum, something we should be uh, thinking about. Uh, the panel is sponsored by the uh, Ethics Committee uh, because I uh, suggested that uh, since uh, there were sort of ethical issues at, uh, at stake, um, that the Ethics Committee could uh, support it, and they have, so thanks to them. Um, so here's how it's going to go. I'm up here with John Cole, who is the Medical Director of the Minnesota Poison Control Center uh, and staff at uh, Hennepin, oh, hello, staff at uh, Hennepin County Medical Center, um, Lauren Klein, who is a faculty and investigator, Brian Driver, who is also faculty and investigator, um, and uh, Jim Miner, I think I, I'm really hoping I don't have timings on this. Um, and it kind of looks like there are. So that could be trouble. Hold on a second. Uh, how can I do that to turn off timings if that inadvertently got put in there? Hmm. Let's see what this does. Or is it just sensitive? Maybe just sensitive. All right, and Jim Miner, Chief of Emergency Medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center. Pardon me for my PowerPoint uh, uh, prowess uh, or lack thereof. So here's how it's going to go. I'm just going to talk about some of the ethical issues that uh, are sort of uh, uh, talked about um, uh, with regard to the care and research of patients who are uh, agitated and altered. Um, and then we'll talk about um, a couple studies that were done uh, across the river uh, at uh, Hennepin County. Um, John will talk a little bit about a pre-hospital agitation study that was done. Uh, Lauren will talk about an in-hospital uh, study of agitation that was done. Um, and then I think uh, we can talk a little bit about sort of the public impressions and media portrayal specifically of uh, uh, what happened uh, after these studies or some response to them. And uh, I think Dr. Minor will present uh, some overview of the institutional responses and then we can talk a little bit about sort of lessons learned from this. Um, uh, and I realize we are competing against both last evening's 30th anniversary party and this morning's uh, Sanosim Wars. So, um, All right. So. Agitation, I think uh, we are all quite familiar, um, particularly my colleagues in this room, with the burden of agitation for uh, uh, our emergency departments. Uh, and this is a study that was uh, done at Hennepin, uh, showed that uh, the prevalence uh, was for about 2.6% of uh, visits in, in uh, their ER, uh, with 23% of those agitated patients presenting with delirium symptoms. And then among patients with agitation, uh, there were significant clinical events that happened uh, in 13 percent of uh, uh, agitation patients uh, without delirium symptoms and 26 percent uh, with delirium symptoms. So hypotension, vomiting, monitoring, need for oxygen um, uh, or airway management. Um, and these were, uh, we have some odds ratios for those um, symptoms happening both with um, delirium symptoms intoxication with a drug other than alcohol and uh, non-drug induced agitation, which I, I think is probably the most interesting of those uh, odds ratios when you think about it. Um, so caring for the agitated patient, we talk about this um, with some regularity, uh, perhaps not uh, frequency. Um, um, we talk about capacity and uh, recall that this is different from competency, which is sort of the more complex and legal definition. <clears throat> and in general, sort of the gestalt assessment of capacity requires that a patient can understand information, reason and deliberate about choices, and make and communicate those choices. And the question of capacity usually arises when patients uh, are making choices that differ what, from what their uh, provider is deeming uh, reasonable. <clears throat> 
Um, now, capacity uh, is highly dependent upon each uh, patient's uh, uh, abilities, also the context, and um, the consequences of the decisions to be made, sort of the need to determine capacity or incapacity um, uh, is, uh, escalates the more uh, severe the consequences or a potential sequela of that can be delegated to a guardian, an agent. We usually talk about a power of attorney or a surrogate, or uh, when we are uh, acting as a surrogate for the patient and following standard of care um, uh, in the be patient's best interest. Whoops. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I am just not working this system well. All right. Um, so here uh, are some uh, basic points uh, that we uh, have in the management of uh, an agitated patient. There's a need to assess their degree of agitation. Um, it is usually suggested that some form of verbal de-escalation or non-pharmacologic de-escalation is uh, attempted. Um, there should be trained security responses when safety is a concern, um, which, uh, you know, uh, given that this is a sort of a, a, a recent suggestion with regard to uh, from an ASAP publication, um, the idea that safety frequently comes into play in these cases I think is key. Um, safe and effective physical restraints, um, chemical restraint or sedation, which is a lot of what we'll be talking about today, and treatment of immediate life threats and diagnoses once you have uh, someone uh, sort of uh, under control. Um, now, research for the altered and agitation, agitated patient uh, is based on um, uh, some of the, some of the uh, elements that are uh, necessary in the research of uh, altered and agitated patients um, have derived from the Belmont Report, right, which uh, uh, sort of governs uh, our uh, informed uh, consent with the idea that we need to be uh, beneficent, uh, have an eye towards justice and respect uh, persons and their right to determine what happens to them um, and that we need to have special protections for those with diminished autonomy and I think uh, folks who are altered and agitated fall into that category. Um, the informed consent process for research uh, participation is uh, sort of the means to secure those rights uh, for participants. Um, so. When you have altered and agitated patients, uh, oftentimes uh, we talk about uh, two um, aspects of doing uh, research because they do not have capacity to uh, frequently to uh, provide consent. So exception from informed consent um, with uh, an original rule in 1996 and then uh, further guidance uh, delivered in 2011 with emergency physicians having uh, contributed uh, significantly to uh, both of those, um, including uh, Michelle Byros from Hennepin County, uh, who is uh, quite key to that. And this is applicable under very narrow uh, clinical circumstances where you have a critical condition, uh, a patient in critical condition, and you have a need for a rapid intervention. And it becomes impracticable, uh, impracticable to obtain uh, informed consent from the patient or a legally authorized uh, representative or LAR, if everyone starts uh, going with that as we talk. Um, there are sort of other criteria, the fact that the idea that there are not other alternatives, that the risk-benefit profile is favorable, and uh, that there's some direct benefit to the patient. Um, and then that if it is possible to obtain uh, consent, that you actually have a process to do that. Um, to get exception from informed consent, you need to do com community consultation, and um, that means addressing and actually soliciting the concerns of um, relevant uh, community. And that can vary depending on the study, what community is relevant uh, to the patient population that, or, or the uh, uh, study participant population. I did it again. Um, that uh, could be potentially enrolled in the study. Um, so the idea is that you go to that community and have some form of soliciting and considering uh, their opinions. And it's meant to be a two-way conversation to enhance the protection and benefits of research uh, in that the population uh, can suggest things uh, to make it more beneficial or to better protect uh, participants. And it also provides uh, some degree of legitimacy to the research as well as respect between uh, 
uh, researchers and uh, the communities uh, that are uh, involved. Um, now, there's, there's not a great sort of uh, guidance on this. There's a lot of literature. Um, there's a lot of variation in how this is done. I think a lot of uh, community consultations end up uh, sort of uh, trending towards sort of formality, and we don't have a whole lot of uh, metrics with regard to efficacy uh, in terms of, you know, does the community truly understand, and uh, et cetera. Um, so the other uh, form of uh, uh, not uh, performing research uh, without obtaining informed consent is to obtain a waiver of informed consent. Um, and this also stems from an earlier act that was updated in 2016 with the 21st Century Cures Act um, and requires that the research involves no more than minimal risk to subjects and that the waiver will not adversely uh, uh, affect the rights or the welfare of subjects and that the research could not be done without a waiver or alterations and that whenever appropriate subjects uh, should be provided with information after their enrollment uh, participation. Um, so these uh, do uh, get confused uh, with some uh, frequency. Uh, I'm on uh, the IRB at our institution and uh, uh, sometimes uh, we slide from one to the other as we're uh, talking about uh, what's the appropriate um, guidance for a particular investigator. Um, so I think, and I'm just going to stay away from the keyboard, John's going to talk a little bit uh, now about the pre-hospital study uh, that was done uh, under waiver of uh, informed consent. So thank you. So, uh, so back in 2002, uh, the state of uh, treatment for pre-hospital agitation as it relates to pharmacotherapy was sort of contained within this picture here. We had reached the point where droperidol had not only received black box warning, but now supply was short, and essentially we couldn't get it anymore. And so our best tool that we, that we knew to use uh, for this patient population was essentially unavailable to us. Uh, we tried various things through the year, through the years, haloperidol, midazolam, <coughs> ketamine, and from our own internal data, what we observed in 2001 to 2002 in a study that Dr. Martel over there published was that when we switched from the primary drug of droperidol because of the black box warning to midazolam, intubations for pre-hospital uh, agitation went up from 10 to 37 percent of patients, and all the other markers of respiratory depression also uh, went up pretty substantially. And then through Dr. Miner's procedural sedation research and um, through his work with end tidal CO2 monitoring, what we also learned through the thousands of patients that we take care of in the emergency department who undergo procedural sedation was that midazolam was much more likely to reduce your respiratory reflexes and evidence uh, of preserving your respiratory drive than ketamine. Furthermore, ketamine has an onset of action that is almost certainly faster than any of these drugs, although we didn't really know in this patient population if that was still true or not. So we applied for a grant from the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology to perform an EFIC study. And for the purposes of keeping the regulations separate from each other, I'm going to refer to the 5024 uh, regulations as EFIC. That's the high-risk, life-threatening condition, studies like the Rampart trial, uh, ESET, that sort, of, that sort of study. And uh, WIC as the 4546 regulations, the more minimal risk study. So WIC low risk, EFIC high risk. And we uh, applied, uh, this is sort of the parameters of what makes ketamine appealing to us, and uh, this is sort of the, the state of the available data so, uh, at the time. So we knew that the drug was, was fast onset and was very, very safe in large populations of patients, but not specifically this one. And this is essentially the state of all the literature there. Shortly after these three articles were published, our, our colleague from Regions, uh, Aaron Burnett, published a case series as well, but it's limited to these very, very small essentially clinical observations. Back to where we were. Uh, we obtained a grant and we uh, applied to do an EFIC trial of ketamine versus haloperidol, which were essentially the most viable options that we had at the time uh, that, we, uh, that we thought would be the safest uh, options, thinking that uh, in the moment that midazolam would be actually the highest risk of the three uh, drugs. We applied for a grant. The American Academy of Clinical Toxicology was generous enough to give us a grant to perform this study, and we presented it through our own IRB, and we used the EFIC plan that was a, a theme and variations of a follow-up study that 
Drs. Martel and Minor did in 2005 uh, comparing three agents for acute agitation in an EVIC manner in uh, the ED at Hennepin. So we completed all five elements of the community consultation. We uh, perform, or, uh, all five elements of the EFIC. We performed a community consultation um, at a place called the Beacon Program, uh, which is uh, now closed, unfortunately, but it was an inpatient um, uh, program for uh, folks with substance use disorders, homelessness, uh, low social determinants of health, um, who uh, all uh, were at ultra high risk for agitation. And when we met with them, actually several of them vividly described incidents in where they had been sedated by ambulance personnel and been brought to the hospital. So I think we, we hit the, the target really well and got some remarkable feedback from them that is probably the subject of another talk someday. Um, we disclosed the trial via a website that we created. Um, we had a plan in place to contact legally authorized representatives to uh, obtain informed consent if we could, uh, which essentially we had in place from the Rampart study that we were a site for. We formed a data safety monitoring board and as is mandated by any AFIC study, you have to notify the FDA. And the only mechanism by which you can do that, unfortunately, is to file an investigational new drug application, which is extremely lengthy, extremely painful, and you have to provide things like sterility and stability data, even for drugs that are FDA approved and already in use. There's just no other mechanism for the FDA to get notified by this. So, this in and of itself was pretty remarkable, but I submitted the uh, IND in April. I received a letter from the FDA a few weeks later that said your uh, study is exempt from needing an IND, and uh, we thought we were able to move on. Interestingly enough, our IRB had just been through reaccreditation, and we had re, uh, sort of relearned the EFIC criteria, and it was pretty clear in the Code of Federal Regulations that an IND was needed from FDA. So we contacted them again and said, we're pretty sure that you need to actually acknowledge or weigh in on this. And they, then I got another letter back that said, you're right, we misread our own regulations. Uh, we, we, need, we need you to submit an IND. And so they, of course, needed me to resubmit everything again. So we did. And then over a period of about six weeks, we had, I think, four or five more correspondence some by letter, some by phone call, where they asked for additional information. They wanted visual evidence of the randomization mechanism uh, because this was, in true EFIC fashion, a double-blind randomized trial. We, had, we planned on using the Rampart boxes. We had pharmacies set up to make labels. Um, we were all ready to go. And uh, I got a mysterious message from them that said, we, we want to meet with you by phone uh, and talk about this before the final decision about your IND is made. And, uh, huh. oh, there, oh my gosh. Try it again. Just use the clicker. Yeah, that's what I did though. And it, okay, all right. And um, remarkably, what happened was uh, there was there was a it was a phone con phone call with about seven or eight people sitting around a table at FDA, and they proceeded to slowly tell me that uh, there's you know we have this issue or this issue with your study, but fundamentally, we plan to not grant your IND because we believe that at some point you should be able to obtain informed consent from your patients before you administer them a medication. And the call was relatively short after that because. It, in our minds, it really, it, it didn't, it seemed like there was just sort of an impasse in our ability to communicate with them, that they, that they were just not, either we failed to describe the patient population accurately or they were just so unfamiliar with the patient population. And, you know, there's no division of emergency medicine at FDA. This goes to psychiatric products, and so everybody who's there is either a psychiatrist or a pharmacist who works in psychiatry or that sort of a thing. There, there's nobody in there practices or really understands emergency medicine. And so some of this could just be a communication gap. So we went back to the drawing board and met again with um, Michelle Byros, who you know, helped draft a lot of these regulations and uh, came up with an alternate way of studying this. And what the final version ended up being was this study that we published in 2016 in clinical toxicology, which was an open labor WIC version of a similar product. So we believe that we could study this in a minimal risk fashion for several reasons. But one of them was that there was extensive belief among the investigators and the EMS personnel 
that while the drugs haloperidol and ketamine were different from each other and had different pros and cons, that they essentially represented equivalent risk to any of the patients, and that anybody who would receive any of the medications would still do so uh, as part of usual care. Uh, so the only thing that varied was which of the drugs was recommended as first line in the EMS protocol, because at some point, something has to be recommended first line. So over seasons throughout the year, the recommended first line drug varied uh, under uh, state stat Minnesota state statute, which is, uh, allows the medical director of the EMS system to dictate which drug is recommended first, but clinical judgment for the paramedic always supersedes that, and they can opt out at any point if they feel like something else is indicated. But the way EMS works, you have to recommend something first line, and so that's what we did. And then after that, we just collected observational data. We collected a standardized agitation score, and we used stopwatches to measure the time to adequate sedation uh, from the moment of injection to uh, the moment they became uh, adequately sedate, and trained all the paramedics in the system to do that. And then the remainder of the study essentially involved collection of normal things in care, any labs they got, uh, any vital signs, that sort of thing. What we found in that study, it was we were, had kind of a low-end enrollment, and we found that side effects were more common with ketamine, but it was faster. And nationwide, far and away the most common drug is midazolam. And so then in 2017, we followed that study up with an identically designed uh, study where the first-line drug varied between midazolam uh, and ketamine. And uh, both of these studies we presented at meetings. The first one was at the um, North American Congress of Clinical Toxicology in 2015. And at, this one was presented last fall at ASEP. And in both cases, actually, we, we were selected for plenary presentations for these. So with that, I'll let Dr. Klein talk about our emergency department research. Thanks, guys. I guess, as per usual, I probably have a little bit less to say than Dr. Cole, because he's he's kind of laid it out really well for you. We, um, our emergency department also sees lots of agitated patients. I think many of you work there, so you know this to be true. So similarly, as droparidol got phased out around 2012, 2013, we started using a lot of olanzapine and lapsoprexa. And a lot of the things we do in emergency medicine, you do so much of it that you actually don't realize that there's no evidence for what, the, what you're doing. There's actually, there was no data at that time actually describing the use of olanzapine for emergency department agitation, which is, should be pretty shocking to most of you that do it 10, 12, 15 times a day. And so we similarly wanted to pursue an EFIC study but using our ED, our ED-based patients, which is fundamentally a different group of patients than the pre patients who are agitated pre-hospital. Generally, their uh, agitation is just going to have a different phenotype. They're probably going to have different, you know, uh, underlying what's causing their agitation, their extent of it. And frankly, probably their, the safety profile, the risk of treating their agitation is probably going to be really different. So we could take some of the information we got from these pre-hospital studies, but really are applying it to a fundamentally very different population. So we thought this was our responsibility to the specialty to really explore this. So, and, and, but the real driver was that olanzapine really didn't have any comparative efficacy, efficacy data out there. So the natural comparators in our minds were Haldol, Zeprazidone, and that came from that 2005 study that Mark did, and then Midazolam, because even though we're a bit on the benzophobic side in our emergency department, really standard of care in the country is to have some either lorazepam or midazolam in your treatment arsenal. So I similarly pursued this as an EFIC, and I remember being in Vegas at ASAP in 2016, and I told Brian, I'm like, I'm going to do an EFIC for this, and Brian's like, good luck. Um, he's like, it's a lot of work. I said, that's okay. You know, this is the time to learn the regulations really well and do this really well because the specialty needs it. I, the, these patients are, have been neglected. We have no evidence-based care for anything that we're doing in this population. So we did all the steps, and again, I don't need to repeat all them because you've heard them a few times now, community consultation disclosure. We had everything, you know, set in stone. Everything was, was rock solid, and I had a similar IND submitted, which I cannot emphasize enough, John's point, how laborious that process is. And I did not have the benefit of having 
that much communication with FDA. They basically called me and said, your proposal is going to committee today at 3 o'clock. Can you be on standby for a phone call? We'll probably want to ask you some questions for an update. I said, okay, absolutely. You know, I'm looking forward to corresponding. And 3 o'clock went by, 4 o'clock went by, 5 o'clock went by, and I'm sitting there on my waiting to get the phone call, and I got the phone call pretty late at night, and it was one of their analysts. It wasn't even from their director of psychiatry products. The analyst just called me and said, we're not going to approve your protocol. They wouldn't, they didn't invite me to come, they didn't invite me to speak at the meeting. They didn't ask for any kind of counter, counterpoint, and they had a, their foot was down that they just fundamentally knew that this patient population could consent to research. They just knew this to be true. So I actually invited them to come out to spend a day in our emergency department. I think that probably would have solved a lot of our problems. And they declined, needless to say. So they pretty much said no, and there's really just no argument here. John made a good point. Like, could this have been our failure to describe the population? But in looking back at how we wrote things, I mean, it was pretty clear. We even pointed them to a study that we did the year before where we actually tried to do a capacity assessment or a consent assessment in the same exact population and I found that only two and a half percent of patients could consent. So I had iron proof that this was not feasible and frankly unsafe and unethical to try to get consent in these individuals. But anyway, it wasn't an option. And so similarly to how John um, and, and in consultation with, with Jeff and, and EMS personnel, we as a department felt so strongly that these were so obviously standard of care treatments. I mean, there was like no question here. We were doing these, we were using these medications every day anyway. So the department as a whole, everyone supported the idea of doing a clinical treatment protocol very similarly, where instead of just the resident making or the faculty making a random decision on every patient, we just had a suggested first line agent, agent rotating these three drugs over the course of about 15 weeks. So there was a clinical treatment protocol, and the reason, oh gosh, the reason that this was eligible for a waiver of consent is because really the only research procedures was use of a stopwatch to record the time using standardized language, so standardized agitation sales, and a data collection form. The actual medication administration decision to administer what to administer was not under the jurisdiction of research at all, it was purely under the jurisdiction of our clinical practice. So. The reason this was eligible for WIC was because this was the only research procedure being done. So if anyone has questions about that, it should be a good time to follow up and ask about that. But this is a really important distinction. So we were able to get excellent data that has, from feedback I've gotten around the country, you know, really changed practice. Bjorn decided to put a picture of me presenting this last year at SAM as a plenary. So I mean, it really got good attention. and. It was well received and people felt for the struggles that we had, but it seemed like the specialty as a whole just was appalled by the fact that FDA thought that it was okay or safe to consent agitated patients. And actually a, a letter to the editor or a, a what's it called? The editorial. editorial came out after this was published. This was, this was affectionately referred to as the matzo trial for all of those of you who enjoy unleavened bread. So there was an editorial about the matzo trial and it essentially just pointed out that there is this gray area. I mean, nobody's going to argue that an unconscious patient in cardiac arrest can't give consent, but there, and then no one's going to argue that a person with a headache probably should be able to give consent, but there is this potentially gray population that the regulations there's just, some, there's just some work that needs to be done to figure out how to do good research in this group because the FDA also took issue with the fact that we were trying to portray that agitation is, a, so you have to have, a, has to be a potentially life-threatening condition. And we know that it can be, but that's hard to really convince to people that don't work with these individuals, reg, individuals regularly. So there's some work to be done on the regulatory side of things on how to best study these patients going forward. Well, I'll just, I'll pull up the, the next step, and I don't know uh, who wants to uh, uh, describe the, uh, the, uh, events. The, the events, perhaps, John, you probably have the best timeline. Uh, but I put up this picture just because I thought it would be useful to recall that this was a plenary from last year at this conference. So, um, 
so last summer, we began to have some trouble. In 2016, Minneapolis police began wearing body cams. As a corollary to that, the Office of Police Conduct Oversight, or Office of Police Conduct Review, which is part of the Division of Civil Rights for the city of Minneapolis, randomly reviews footage from body cams. These are civil rights workers, they're not medical workers. And they noticed that sometimes on police body cams, when the police were at the scene, there was a disturbed person, paramedics would sometimes <coughs> arrive and administer a drug that they were able to determine was ketamine, and the patient would rapidly become, in their eyes, unconscious and be placed in an ambulance and hauled away. And there was some coarse language that was observed on those videos as well. They uh, determined that they needed to commission their own report to look into the use of this because it was, in their eyes, uh, possible that the police were coercing our paramedics into giving ketamine for the purposes of subduing a subject. In our eyes, I don't think any of us believe that that's what actually occurs. When we see those people, we see them as patients who are potentially critically ill and often are. But, yep. But that report was generated, and when a draft report was viewed finally by some folks with expert content who were able to tell them having non-medical people generate a 30-page report based on internet searches effectively of ketamine, referring it to it as, for instance, a date rape drug, et cetera, and making their own medical judgments about what happened on the video based on words from police officers as opposed to reviewing medical records or consulting anybody who was involved directly in the patient care. For instance, they made a judgment that a patient experienced a cardiac arrest with, with no medical training whatsoever. Uh, the folks who had expert medical training when they saw this draft said, this is preliminary at best and, and if you release this as is, it's a, not an accurate representation and, and could result in, um, in problems. And that, of course, is exactly what happened. It was almost immediately released. Uh, the first story was written in the Star Tribune. And on the video, uh, it also was noted that we had research going on. Subsequent to that, uh, uh, a local reporter for the Star Tribune named Andy Mannix, who has taken this on, uh, wrote several studies and tracked down people who had been in our study, who we, in all cases, when, whenever possible, we notified uh, patients that were in the study and then gave them the option of taking their observational data out because that was essentially the only risk to them, that there was, they received medications in usual care and, and the only real risk was a data breach. And so if they wanted, we, we gave them the opportunity to remove their data. And uh, subsequent to that, um, two of the local bioethicists at the University of Minnesota opined uh, extensively and negatively about our work and made some misleading statements and in fact in some cases factually inaccurate statements about our work uh, that generated further stories and led to this story down here where some local politicians started to weigh in calling our work unconscionable and unethical, saying that it was unethical to study patients without their consent. There was political pressure that mounted, and because our relationship with the community and our patients is the most important thing that we do, right? Taking care of people. If, if there's no patients then, and, uh, and they don't trust us, that, that's the thing that matters the most. To sort of calm things down, we agreed to pause data collection on the study until we could clarify things for everybody. Uh, that study, uh, that was followed up shortly after by uh, the two bioethicists working with a public advocacy, ag advocacy watchdog group called Public Citizen to file complaints with multiple organizations throughout the United States about our work, which then generated stories in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Forbes, and even an article in Nature that you see there calling our work controversial, uh, among other things. Uh, and uh, from there, uh, things uh, continued to get um, difficult politically. And 
since then, we've uh, sort of paused data collection on essentially anything involving waiver of consent for the time being while we look at our processes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Miner. I'm kind of afraid of it. <laughs> so that's quite a mess, huh? So <laughs> this is a, a very difficult problem. It's essentially, most of the people that found our work controversial actually didn't know what our work was. Um, the newspaper was consistently um, misleading. And it wasn't because they were having a hard time uh, telling the truth or getting the facts. They sat and talked to, to John and I, Andy Max, for three hours before his first article. And he completely misrepresented everything about our trial. But he was completely aware of what was going on. So it was, it was odd, because I just I hadn't realized, I don't think any of us realized that they really weren't particularly interested in telling what actually happened or was going on. It was not the Star Tribune's goal. Their goal was to make a really interesting story that people would like. So they picked and choose bits and pieces of facts and presented them in such a way to make people as angry as possible and to generate as much controversy as possible to get more people to read their paper with absolute reckless disregard for the damage they're doing to the people in our community we're making it impossible to observe our care of them so we can continue to improve our practice. Um, so it was horrible what they did. Uh, and I, don't, I still don't know the fix for that because they have not improved what they do on any level. But that was, we didn't realize that actually was, was an issue. Uh, that caught us off guard. We thought the newspaper was someone that was there to just tell how the world works. Every ER doc sees newspaper stories. And where they know what really happened because we were in the ER and the newspaper is completely wrong. And I always assumed it's because it's so hard to get facts because everyone in the ER can't tell them the story and they don't really know and they're just trying to do the best thing. But this was very difficult for me to realize that they actually knew all the facts and they were choosing to misrepresent them. Um, I don't know if they ever actually lied so much as just picked and, picked and choose little bits of things to say when they cared to. Anyway, this caught us off guard. Uh, the political reaction was tough because we had a couple of uh, politicians who were leading up to re-election, they wanted to get some attention, so a lot of politicians started jumping in and giving opinions. Um, things got really out of hand really quick. But nobody knew actually what our research was. And nobody, we had no way of getting the information out because we tried talking to the news and that made it worse. So we stopped talking to them right away. We're stuck, nobody knows what's really happening. Everyone's got opinions about it, but most of them have no idea what we're talking about. Even physicians, colleagues were writing pieces in papers and clearly confusing the difference between EFIC and waiver of consent. It's a subtle issue if you don't do that kind of research, but they're completely different. So they would talk about how we we're doing an EFIC study. We weren't. Um, that's okay, but we just couldn't get our story out. So we formed a crisis team. It was made up of us, the researchers, um, and I guess I was there as a researcher and as the leader of our department, and we brought in the paramedic managers. The paramedics were getting all sorts of trouble, uh, you know, yelled at and stuff when they picked up patients, things like that. Um, the IRB leadership, the head of our po hospital public relations, our CEO, our CMO, um, our, and then the county attorney. So our, our hospital's legal team, because we're a county hospital. So we had a couple of county attorneys in there. And we started meeting every day at first, uh, trying to figure out what was going on. And this actually ended up being really useful. Um, we brought all these people together, and we just started meeting. And just honestly, we spent the first few weeks just processing what was going on because it was moving faster and everything we had done at first to try to make it better made it worse. So we stopped doing anything. Just kind of said, we're just gonna sit, get more information about what's going on. That actually ended up being the right thing to do. Our initial response is, the first press conference on this was our CMO, who's an emergency physician, and had started his career as a researcher, uh, tried to explain this research, and what he said is, we didn't, we didn't break any rules. We, we followed the rules correctly. Because uh, that's just kind of a natural response for a leader to say, right? We, we didn't actually do anything wrong. That's not what the community wanted to hear. They weren't actually worried about our research or the rules. They thought police were using our paramedics to sedate people that didn't want to be arrested. Um, what, what the answer should have been is uh, when the police call paramedics, we give a variety of drugs. Sometimes we give Narcan if they're unconscious. Sometimes we give ketamine if they're so crazy we think they're going to hurt themselves. 
Sometimes we put them on oxygen. The medics make a decision. It's a medical decision. It's not a police decision. Once the police call, the person's no longer under arrest. They're now a medical patient, and they go to the hospital, not jail. Because people didn't understand that. We didn't actually realize that nobody understood that. So we never said that. And that story still hasn't really gotten out to the community. Um, if we'd started with that story, this would have been a very different, it would have framed the discussion differently. Then people could have said, why do you collect data on that? We said, well, we need to. And we would have had a much different discussion. Now, are we giving experimental drugs to help people get arrested? Which is the narrative that the Star Trib was telling and that the, the, um, those bioethicists from the U, our colleagues in theory, uh, were, were constantly saying we were doing. Oh, I went the wrong way. So we started setting up community forums to try to get our story out because we didn't want to try to go through the newspaper again. We don't trust them, still don't trust them. Um, that was not a good way to work it. They were not trying to help in any way. They were trying to make things worse. Uh, so they were only looking for us to make mistakes, so we stopped engaging with them. Uh, so we set up community forums. Um, these, the, and I, I, I have to call them bioethicists because that's their titles, but I use the term loosely because they really don't appear to be ethical people on any level. I mean, they're really going out of their way to mislead people and draw attention to themselves. Uh, also set up some community forums which were, interestingly enough, the people that ran these community forums were these bioethicists and malpractice lawyers, which I thought was, don't want to get too far into what their goals were there, but they seemed pretty clear to me what their actual goals were in trying to stir up controversy here rather than patient rights. Um, anyway, our community venues, they did help, actually. We met with the community commissioners. We met with people. We, let, we, are, we had groups all over, and we were able to start getting our story out to key community leaders. And what we really found was important was if we're not going to be able to go through the newspaper and tell our story, we need to go to people that they will listen to. Uh, so we started hitting key people. Um, we also got our own hospital employees up to date on things because they were getting, it was in the newspaper constantly, so we were getting, what are you guys doing ahead of them, experimenting on people? Um, so we talked to our own hospital employees, made sure they had the story straight. Ooh, that got out of hand. So then, this button. So, we've continued to go with that. We've now formalized that process. We now have a research advisory board, which is uh, uh, looking at all of our research before it goes to the IRB for review. And, we, and that's more of an internal thing. And we have a public research advisory board, the, the PRAB, we call it now. And that is a, a group of community leaders uh, who represent various aspects of the patients we serve who then look at our research after IRB approval to give us recommendations on community notification. We're still in the process of making that group work. So right now, we're only having them look at WAVES consent research, because they're not really ready. It's hard to take a bunch of non-physician community leaders and say, here's research, approve it. Because they don't really, like the first meeting was our IRB chair spending an hour explaining what an IRB was and what consent was and what research was. And these are very intelligent people. It's just not what they do. And I presented one, the most simple project we have. It's like a, it's a little probe that measures carbon, carbon monoxide. And we're trying to compare it to the old kind of probe. It's like an industry-sponsored study. It's wave consent research because you can't consent someone who's CO poisoned. Um, and they, they've really been processing that study for the next three or four meetings, maybe three months since. And we purposely picked such a simple trial to get them started. But they, that hasn't become functional yet. So we have not, when John says we still really haven't started up on wave consent research, that's, everything's ready to go, but we're still trying to work out the nuts and bolts. When we, when we put this application to this lecture, I was sure we'd have it all worked out by now. But the main thing I've learned from that is that's taking a lot longer than we thought. You can't have community members who don't get paid meet more than once, maybe twice a month. You can't have a meet for more than two hours. And we can't rush them. Uh, so we'll, we'll get there, but it's going much slower than we ever thought it would. So what have we learned and what have we done since? Because we have done press interviews since then. We limit who does the press interviews. It's usually me now. And we, I prepare for it intensely. We try to come up with every single question that we think they could possibly ask me. And somebody practices answer, asking me the questions so I have all my answers ready. We actually have multiple people watch me, including community members from the PRAB. So if I say anything that they think is, we know now that the press will just pick three words that I say that would be the most 
destructive thing, even if it was in the middle of a sentence and we're totally out of context. So I actually practiced, practiced speaking. So like, there's no way to take any even single word out of anything I said that could be used to uh, try to alienate our community. Um, and that worked. The last time I interviewed with him, we also, we, we controlled the time. We had very limited time. We said exactly what place it's going to be. I practiced it. Um, and we made sure it was just me they talked to. And it was frustrating for them because they were trying to get me to mess up. And uh, I was very, very well prepared. And no one else would speak to them. Um, now, of course, even at that, the last interview I had with the Star Trib was in December. And they quoted me in a newspaper article last weekend. But the quote they put from me was an answer to a question I gave completely unrelated to what they said I was answering in there. So they're, they're still, I mean, no matter what you do, right? They wrote this whole big thing and they said, and the <coughs> miners said, but it, well, I did say that, but it was, in, it was in, it's into a totally different question from four months previous. Uh, so even, even at that, that's a dangerous beast, but we're much more careful about it now. We um, made some press releases on our own as well, so we could control the pace of it as, as things continue to move on. Um, as, as things continue to move forward, we now, we, when we see something coming that might lead to an article, we actually make the press release on our own. And we contact all the key community leaders first, so they get our story first before they get it from the newspaper, and start preparing me for, um, for interviews. And we're also preparing a few others. But we're very, going to be very clear, and we're going to try to keep control of who speaks and when. Um, other things we learned is that uh, and I, we were talking about this in a social media session that I gave yesterday. When we engaged social media attacks, it just made it worse. And we, we learned the hard way that the only way to deal with social media trolls, which is essentially how these biowethicists from the EU function, is to just not engage, not engage with them at all. Because what they're looking for is anything, and they do it professionally. They're very good at using anything against you. So you just can't engage them. Because uh, when you engage them, you increase their, the more people that see them. Uh, it reminds me of that, you know in that scene in Harry Potter, if they touch anything, it <coughs> up, and then eventually the whole room fills up. I can't remember what movie I was watching that with my kids recently. I'm like, that's like social media with people you don't like. Because the, the more you do anything, the worse it gets. And just, so we now know it's just, just not even, I think, do any of you have your Twitter accounts on anymore? No, I don't. Yeah, she's yeah. untwittered for a while. Break. We took a little break. <laughs> uh, and the, the other thing we learned, and this is probably the hardest history, the thing we've learned the hardest, and we can't take back is the first version of the story that gets out might be the only one, even if it's not true. And so now we're being very careful when we hear a story coming to get ours out first, so we can actually tell people what's really going on and not the not the uh, inaccurate version. No. Well, thanks, guys, for uh, sharing uh, the story of uh, what you guys have been dealing with for the last year. Um, and for the lessons learned, I think those are uh, important uh, in that I think this kind of thing could come up in just about any urban community in the United States. Um, it's been interesting being across the river and uh, watching uh, events um, and uh, I have some affiliation with Hennepin, I'm a hyperbaricist there and so um, having a little bit of an ear to the ground at the institution as well. Um, I have taken personally uh, away some, some additional lessons um, also as a researcher who's out uh, uh, in the community. Um, it seems pretty clear to me that we as a specialty have not um, conveyed the uh, nature of care for altered and agitated and often violent patients in the pre-hospital or the emergency department setting as uh, a critical uh, care issue in the same way that we talk about heart attacks or strokes or other uh, time critical conditions that have uh, time sensitive interventions. And um, I think there's, there's work to be done there. We, we think of that as being ASEP, but, um, but I think if you look at the bottom, it seems clear that uh, some public and policy engagement is probably necessary, especially for maintaining the space and the, the capacity to do uh, pre-hospital research uh, in emergency medicine in these critical conditions. Uh, and then again, as, as someone who does a lot of community research, um, it seems very clear to me that particularly in our urban environments, um, uh, there's a need to have some ongoing in engagement with the communities that we serve, which you guys have really set up, um, and not just sort of the, the usual folks that we have liaisons with, detox, shelters, et cetera, the police. Uh, 
Um, and so there's, I think there's some, some work in addition to what uh, Jim talked about in the uh, addressing politicians and media and community members and getting, getting a sense of how to do that uh, public relations kind of thing, which uh, uh, leaders in emergency medicine probably need to have some on hands, uh, hands on training in. So thank you all for coming out uh, at 8 a.m. Um, we have the room for a little bit if anybody wants to uh, throw up a question. I know uh, most of the folks in the room are from the Twin Cities, but uh, anybody who is not or who has a question. Uh. The one uh, major group that wasn't on your response team, I noticed, is actually you know, somebody truly from the media, right? Because there is, there is an argument to be fighting fire, addicted to fire, right? Like being able to control your message in that way. Um, because if they're asking questions and they're presenting the information, then they control the message, right? So you need to, in my view, you need somebody to be able to help kind of carry your message forward that is independent from the hospital and your group. Yeah, we, we did actually, and I forgot to mention, we hired a consultant, uh, two consultants. One was a former news anchor, man, anchor woman in, in the Twin Cities, and then another was a, just a, a, a PR, a public relations external consultant. So those are consultants that <coughs> Um, they told us how to try to get the media to release information we wanted, but honestly, was uh, we were not feeling, and I still don't feel like I would trust the media to work with them after what's happened. I think uh, we don't, we don't, we didn't know which. None of them that we worked with had any intention of telling the right story because the other one was more interesting. So I wouldn't have wanted them in the room because I wouldn't have trusted them to release accurate information about our discussions. Yeah, you know, I guess um, that's, I think it's really good to find those people in the media that are trustworthy, right? Like that's clearly that's what we dealt with is unethical people, and so that you, you can't um, can't deal with them anymore, and so they're going to continue to write what they have. But I mean, we see this is the way. One of the things President Trump does really well, right? Like, is actually he sort of fights fire with fire, right? And so having somebody that. Well, our consultants helped with that. I mean, they, they helped us write our press releases, showed us where to say them. Um, we didn't have an actual person for the media, but the, the consultants knew where to send stuff to a certain extent. Uh, you know, and one thing I forgot to say, and I'm totally remiss in saying this part of the response, is I contacted ASAP, like, as soon as this all started, and they were really helpful. Um, the, Sandy Schneider wrote a letter to the, the key politicians who were angry at us explaining that American College of Physicians supports this research, this important work, and they've all the way along, they're really helpful. So that was the one thing I left out of my slides and I was remiss is uh, contacting ASEP main office on the main day was a huge benefit for us. Uh, they, really, they really were great. And they put us in contact with external experts to come in and look at our research and show how things work, uh, research experts to come in and give us advice on how to better explain what we were doing. Uh, the resources were incredible and fast. I think we're out of time. Yeah, we're out of time. So. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.